The government's most vocal critic was the top atmospheric scientist, Professor James MacDonald. Why has the government taken this attitude, in your opinion? As a result of the extremely heavy wave of sightings in 1952, the CIA and Air Force became so concerned over the sheer number of uh, uh, reports that were tying up Air American intelligence channels that they wanted to get this signal out of the system, asked the Air Force, the CIA asked the Air Force for a debunking policy. The literal wording was to debunk the flying saucers, to decrease public interest in the UFOs, uh, regulations were promulgated uh, very shortly that made it a crime uh, punishable with, I think it's $10,000 fine and or 10 years in prison to release any information at air base level on UFOs. And as a result of that, nothing resembling any scientific investigation has been going on in the past uh, 15 years. In Australia, we followed the American policy of ridiculing UFOs. So I started searching for other sightings that might have happened around the same time as Westall. I discovered that four days before Westall, a witness took a photo from his backyard in Melbourne that matched descriptions of the object above Westall. Then, just two days before Westall, Ron Sullivan was driving in central Victoria when he noticed a strange light display in front of him. I got up towards it and holy moly, the whole thing lit up in the 10 foot area at the bottom sort of come up and met the top and the headlights of the car was the biggest awesome thing I've ever seen. I just pulled to the right of this, I magnetised. I could see all the trees on the right hand side of the road lighting up and I said, get out of this one, and I pulled on the left. And I could feel the back left wheel spinning and I got out of that. Ron only reported the incident after he heard that a young man died when his car collided with the same tree Ron had narrowly missed two days earlier. A couple of people from the government department came and visited me. I know one was from the Air Force. They looked at the car, just walked around. I said, well, let's know what you find out. And they said, yeah, we will. We will, Mr Sullivan. Never heard any more about it. When I checked out the Royal Australian Air Force's list of UFO sightings for 1966, none of these cases were mentioned, though we know they investigated them. It took 16 years for records to be made available to UFO researchers. They knew what I wanted to look for, and when I arrived, uh, there was a body of files there that consisted of a couple of very large uh, postal sacks. I kept requesting more and more files, and ultimately I got to a point where I examined a continuity of files that satisfied me that I was seeing a comprehensive picture of the RWF investigation at that time. I had a shopping list of things that I was focused on and uh, one of the key cases that I wanted to find out about uh, was the Westall case. And surprising with the rest of the shopping list I was fairly successful but the, the, the Westall case, given that there seemed to be literally at least hundreds of people involved with it that had media attention at the time. There appeared to be evidence that there was a military investigation at the time. Um, there was no Westall file. The disclosure team uh, was between about six and nine people over, over the years. As you can imagine, a four or five year project, as it turned out, needed quite a lot of effort. Literally, it was looking through hundreds and hundreds of file titles, maybe even thousands at the end. Along the way, we were always looking for files on the Westall incident from 66. We started off with the Air Force, but within the Department of Defence, we also checked out uh, files belonging to the Air Board, unit files from Air Force bases, former Department of Civil Aviation, Air Safety Bureau, the CSIRO, intelligence files, ASIO. But the net result is we found nothing in this mammoth a volume of, of government documentation uh, which would even begin to be a hint that there was something about Westall in the government files. So uh, amazingly we drew a blank. The Westall sighting had clearly been erased from the record but why? I hope some publicity would draw former authorities out of the woodwork. Oh, I'm nice to oh, make a shame. <laughs> Joy, is it Mark yep. Howe from Channel 10? Nice to meet you. What we're really trying to get now is the people who are here as police, as soldiers, as scientists perhaps, looking close up at what was on the ground. Some closure, Joy. How would you get some closure on this? One thing that we would really like would be that someone either from the police or the military would come forward and say, yes, they were there. <laughs> Not 
Nobody from the authorities contacted me, but another witness did. Kevin Hurley saw the circles at the Grange on the day of the sighting and went back the next day for another look. Then when we came to the area where we'd gone through the paddock, yes. there was the Air Force of the Army, um, a whole group of them there, stopping us from going through into the paddock. Don't come near this in this area. And we, we just um, headed off, headed off back home. And did they give you any reason no. why you couldn't come through? No. There were vehicles on the paddock um, and they had some sort of instrument which at the time I thought looked like Geiger counters. The strong memory I've got is what happened after that. And about a week later, I decided to go back again to have another look. As soon as we got down to where the, the paddock started, all the grass had been cut, which was quite disturbing. Wow. So then we walked through that area to where the um, circles were, and when we got into the area where the circles were previously, the whole area had been burnt, destroying all evidence. You asked me whether an R&D establishment would destroy evidence. Yes, of course they would. Bearing in mind that in the 1960s, Australia had great success uh, financially with uh, some of their pilotless target aircraft information related to some of these sorts of projects, if it was to be released to the, to the wrong party, uh, then it would have very adverse effects on Australia from a financial point of view. Any surviving documentation uh, would be in Defence Central somewhere, uh, but also um, probably overseas with the Allies. There may even not be anything left in, in Australia, because bearing in mind it would have been very highly classified and could well have been destroyed as so much of that sort of record is after a period of time. So it's no wonder that I haven't unearthed any official records on Westall, but it's clear the authorities had something to hide. Just got called into the gymnasium and then these people spoke and um, you know, they just sort of said, oh, well, what you saw was sort of an experimental thing and you know, we just don't want anyone talking about it or it going any further, so. How many people were there that came and do you remember? I think there was five, from memory. And they were, were they men and women or? Um, yeah, I think there was three men and two women, for memory. So I'm not 100%. Sure. And you remember, do you remember if they were wearing uniforms? Some no, they're, were just, in uniforms, no, they're just, just in plain suits. and In suits? Yeah. And did they explain where they were from, who they were? No, not really. Um, just. A couple of the teachers said afterwards they're from some one of these experimental mobs to do with the armed forces and stuff like that and, and, uh, and that was your, sort of the end of it. it. It had to have been something that we were working on and we, we, we knew all about it. We were in on it, even though we might not have known the detail. To have responded, that's one of the, that really to my, to my way of thinking, that's the key is the fact that we respond, whoever it was, the authorities responded so rapidly that they must have just about been sitting on the trucks with the engine going. And perhaps they were. Perhaps they'd received technical intelligence that there was something going wrong with this experimental craft and they weren't sure where it was going to land, but they were ready to go get it as soon as it did land. It sounds like a rational, logical explanation, but it needs then to be supported with evidence. If you think about how the people described the shape of it, the speed, the manoeuvres that it made, there is nothing around today that comes close to that. The final proof might be, for example, getting a piece of the flying saucer and examining it, uh, subjecting to, to scientific examination and finding that it's, it's a, uh, of an element that is not manufactured on Earth. Now that would maybe the final proof. We haven't got that. So we're still at the circumstantial uh, evidence stage and whether that leads you to say, well, th these are from outer space, they're interplanetary spaceships or not is, is a philosophical question. That's a question of what, what you yourself feel is proof. A yellow sign. I crave the proof that can be held in my hands and touched and smelled and measured. But I think we need to make room for a little mystery in our lives as well. I reckon yeah. Somewhere in this area. 
I believe truth can exist without proof of it, and I see a real truth in the stories and memories of the witnesses, probably... even if it doesn't answer the question, what was it that flew over Westall? What I saw, I believe, is what a flying saucer has left behind.